Dr. Vatsad, uh, Mr. Gare Khan, Shannuji, many respected seniors. It's an impossible task to say even a few words after Dr. Kapla Vatsayan has spoken. I mean, we all know it, so let's not fool ourselves. It would take a lifetime to catch up with her, and at 63, one has very few residual years. I have this uh, binary thing going on with uh, Dr. Vatsayan. She's just my mother's age, and it's very difficult to disagree and survive. But then she has permitted me certain indulgences, so I would take off from where she has left. She's very right when she calls Jayadev as the uh, creator of Radha. But in a way, I would love to uh, sort of put in my little bit. By tracing the tradition of Radha, which runs almost parallel to Krishna, for a long, long time. If Krishna is first found in some formative embryonic state in Chandogya Upanishad and Taitariya Aranak, which is 7th and 6th centuries BC, Radha's actual pulsation starts from the Aham poetry of the Sangam era. So that's just two, two centuries after. Uh, no, I'm not correcting, I'm just amplifying, because I, I'll come to that point. So Radha, as a person, is, does not find specific mention, but the Aham poetry creates that atmosphere of love, jointness, and sometimes borders on to eroticism in a manner that would shock North India. But it was there. And then we move fast forward to see when does Krishna get embodied in a very corporal form. Krishna's embodiment happens in the fourth century. All scholars more or less come down, which is the final version of Mahabharata, the main accepted version of the Bhagavad Gita, and also the century of Harivansa. So Krishna as a scholar and as a strategist, a diplomat, a philosopher, is enshrined by the fourth century AD. His origins, as I said, goes back. Now, at this point of time when official literature, sacred literature in North India was drawing the lines and contours of Krishna, they came across a second version of Krishna that would actually endear him to the masses as we move along, and that is Balakrishna. Balakrishna would start appearing from the Harivangsa, has no mention in Mahabharata and Gita. Balakrishna would bring in Vatsalya, one of the greatest attractions that Krishna would have in his child form. But let's move on, try to find Radha. I'm fresh because I just delivered a talk at the Victoria Memorial Calcutta a few days ago, just four days ago. So we find that during this fourth century, for the next 400 years, we have certain pulsations, but not the capture of the concept. Alvars. The Alvars or Arvas of, again, Tamil country would begin their journey. And we find a character taking shape, which finally comes out in the 9th century Bhagavad Puran. Many of you may be amazed to know that the Bhagavad Puran was not composed in North India. It was composed in Tamil Nadu, present Tamil country. The Bhagavad Puran takes off from this tradition and we can find a character called Napinai. Napinai is still a common name in Tamil Nadu. A favored milkmaid. A fa we have come very close. And as Kapilaji rightly said, the only spashed word we get is Aradhita. Aradhita. So Aradhita has often been say, said to be the roots of Radha. And we take it like this. But then there are two, three controversial passages that come in now. In the 6th century, when I, 6th century, the first time we find Hala's Gatha Saptasati, mentioning Hala's Gatha Saptasati or Gatha Saptasai, or Maharashtra, mentioning, O Krishna, by the puff of your breath, as you blow the dust from Radha's face, you take away the glories of other milkmaids. Chapter 1, Pada 225. 
So we have Hala coming in the 6th century and mentioning Radha. That means here is a concept that's floating around but not being personified, not being captured, not being described. Let us not forget for a single moment that our divinity in India is in a state of continuous improvement. And what I mean by improvement is not that the divine is improved, but the perception of the divine and what that embodiment of consensus means, where the people are concerned, that improves. So it's a rolling Magna Carta. Indian religion has always been a rolling Magna Carta that picks up as it moves along. The next mention we find is very interesting. This is in Banabhatta's Harsha Charitra and it's very specific. Banabhatta's, that's the sixth century, one century before. The breasts of Radha made Krishna dance in the courtyard and the people were overjoyed. So there we find. But then remember, Banabhatta or Hala were mentioning Padas, just occasional references and materials. Nobody had captured the concept until we come to Jayadev, until we come to Bhagavata Puran, which is the main document. And then we move on from 4th, 6th, 5th, 6th to 9th, which is the Bhagavata Puran. And in the 11th, 12th century, we get Jayadev coming in all his majesty. Look at the amount of work, research this gentleman had to do. If it takes us so long to find out even his roots, to set the ball in its perspective, I would say that having dealt with the subject in a very historical manner, certainly not near, where is, I don't know where Dr. Subhash Pani is, but certainly not, oh, huh? oh, there is, not like him, but I am a dry student of social anthropology, social history and anthropology, and I'll put it like this. There is no doubt that Jayadev belonged to Odisha, what is in present Odisha. There was this appropriative tendency among Bengal for a couple of centuries when it thought no end of itself to go on appropriating all traditions. This is a uh, disease that um, uh, Tamils also uh, expressed where the rest of India was concerned, the South, South India was concerned. But a very, very Bengali uh, response. I know I may be beaten up outside, but fact remains that spiritually, but let me divide the goods. While Jayadev would build the concept, the two early propagators of the Radha Krishna legend, one was Vidyapati of Mithila, that is from Mr. Jha's country, and the other was Chandidas from Bengal. So we have Bengal, Odisha, and Mithila sorting out its equations where a single character and a tale is concerned, we have absolutely no conflict. I don't know how much I would be able to say in Calcutta and survive, but fact remains, as a student of history, he belongs to Odisha, or what is present in Odisha, just like Chandidas belongs to Birbhum and Bengal, and it goes on. Incidentally, if you notice the timing, 12th century, India was in turmoil in the 12th century, and the West was in a state of dizziness, where Chauhan and Tomar and uh, Rathors and others were fighting each other out. The East was in relative peace, and therefore you find this triangulation between Bengal, Mithila, Bihar, and Odisha. In any case, it doesn't matter. I'll tell you why it doesn't matter, because he wrote in Sanskrit, number one. So Sanskrit was the governing language, and number two is the fact that both Odia and Bengali and Assamese all derived their language from Mithila. So in any case in the 12th century, it's a retrospective argument put in for various odd reasons. So we find, and then we move on, there are two, three more links that leads to Jayadev. And I think I should only mention this in passing. One is Bhatta Narayan's Veni Samara, then Ananda Vardhan's Dhyana Loka. There are mentions in Vikrama Bhatta and Somdev Suri. That's yours. So all put together, there was, as I keep saying, the pulsation of an idea, but the person who could actually conceive, collate, collage, and give it form and shape in the most melodious manner was Jaydev. And therefore, we celebrate Jaydev. That the tradition would be taken forward. And just one more addition to what uh, Dr. Vatsayana said, the embodiment, what did it all lead to, finally? 
it led to not only one unchangeable poem with hundreds of renditions and recessions, it led to a social turmoil at a time when cohesion was required in India. And this would directly lead from the 12th century to the 14th century, 15th century, in the form of the Aschap Kavis picking on this tale and the greatest of them, Surdas, making it the lingua franca, the, 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 the cultural personification of India. Surdas comes in, followed by Narayan Das. We have many others, about the six more. But then we have a very interesting thing with the Aschap Kavi. Again, I'm bringing the East and West complex. The Aschap Kavis, with all their beauty, got Radha and Krishna married off. Whereas the East, Odisha and Bengal, maintain the southern tradition that everything is all right as long as there is a love. The interpretation of Chatamila, the interpretation was a little different. But I'm just mentioning this for the sake of unity in diversity, diversity in unity, and how we maintain these, these forms. Surdas in the 15th, followed by Mirabai in early 16th, would be formulating the song and the, the song and the persona of Radha and Krishna. But they would immediately be followed by three missionaries, prophets, philosophers, what you call. And these three are as important, other than the minstrels of love. They are Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they are Hankar Dev or Shankar Deva of Assam, and the third is Vallabhacharya of Western India. These two would be positing this story as a central theme of love and unity within India. And it's only once 50 to 60 years later that there would be a complete fountainhead of art and creativity coming up. Dr. Vatsayan mentioned about all the schools of art that came in. But as any student of art knows that the actual Rubicon was crossed when the Mughal ateliers were set up in 1555. Prior to the setting up of the Mughal ateliers, we got a form of art that was bichromatic, trichromatic, but not polychromatic. It is certainly not anywhere there. So in the pre-Mughal period, we also get in the Sultanate period certain paintings. But it's only after the Mughal atelier was set up, and in the late 16th century and 17th century, art just burst out on the Indian format that Dozens of schools came up, and as Dr. Kapla Vatsan rightly says, the schools of Rajasthan, and she did a lovely work uh, on uh, Darbhanga. I had no clue that uh, it had gone to Darbhanga. There was, it's outside also, you'll see it. So with these few words, I would try to supplement what has been said. Jaydev is one of those prophets who comes up once in an age, captures a lot of what is there in the folk, in the spoken word, through little tales and excerpts, but then weaves the story around in such a fascinating manner that he becomes the property, the pride of the Indian people. With these words, I thank Pratap Jha first. Sir, you don't have to do mine because I'm starting from the, the, the executive end. Dr. Pratap Jha and his team in the multimedia center here, I had the good fortune of working with him slightly, and I shall torment him after this. Dr. Vatsayan for carrying on this uh, intensively patient exercise and Mr. Gare Khan and the IGNCA for bringing out such a wonderful communicative, interactive and PowerPoint project as she puts it. Without these forms of interlocution, these will remain the property of those above 60. To bring it down to the India of 65% that is below 35, the only way we can approach is to bring them in their language, in their content, in their desire. With these words, I thank all of you for the patient supplementing of Dr. Vatsan, which is extremely difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you.